Welcome to the Asia Tech Podcast. I'm your host for today, Gustavo Liu, and this is the Pitch Tech Asia. Today, this week, we have Julian Lee, the founder and CEO, well, actually, sorry, it's co-founder <laughs> and CEO of an IoT company um, called Ambi Labs. Mm -hmm. That's the company, right? That, that's that's actually. Company. Well, welcome to the show, Julian. Thanks for having me. Um, and you're from Hong Kong. Yeah, I'm from Hong Kong. Well, a yeah. bit of a long story, but you know, I was kind of uh, from Singapore originally, grew up in Hong Kong, and then studied in the UK, and then uh, came back to Singapore, lived here for a while, served the country, and then went back to Hong Kong. And like Hong Kong, obviously, is one of the like the most vibrant financial hubs, mm -hmm. right? To do a startups over there and work on it, because you've Ambilab is is sort of a later, more mature startup. Mm -hmm. um, you guys created since twenty twelve. Yeah, was yeah. that when it was formed? Um, and then during that period, um, is sort of enjoy that pe that that environment of financial <laughs> um, turn. How mm -hmm. many cycles? <laughs> Um, I guess, I mean, in terms of cycles, I think Hong Kong has been, it's been pretty much the, you know, kind of the same sort of environment in the last, you know, sort of yeah. five or six years. I mean, we've been seeing, certainly, I think within the financial industry, you've been seeing contraction, a lot of consolidation in the financial industry, yeah. which has also meant like a great boom of startups in Hong Kong, because a lot of, you know, people who've left the financial industry and starting their own thing and no, that's certainly and also a with, with that entire trend of like China mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, really incentivizing for startups in ju actually uh, post 2010, right? Um, we've seen this entire boom and Hong Kong was essentially one of the biggest sort mm. of um, funding centers around that sort of North Asia region. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that Hong Kong has definitely benefited. I think it's, but it's not, maybe not as much, it's not as much uh, sort of, uh, sort of VC money in Hong Kong as compared mm -hmm. to in China. I mean, I think China is definitely booming a lot further, yeah. but Hong Kong has still uh, benefited quite strongly. So you've seen sort of like Chinese uh, sort of uh, funded, uh, you know, these uh, VCs uh, like yeah. in Hong Kong and, you know, definitely uh, expanding that ecosystem. I really am very interested in the Hong Kong sort of startup ecosystem, mm -hmm. especially you as the founder, you know, the journey that you had to go through from your very early raising funds. Mm -hmm all the way to like now, which is like series A and B onwards, um, that entire sort of VC appetite mm -hmm. is very, very different from how we see it here in Singapore. So let's talk a little bit about Ambi Labs. Sure. And you are a serial entrepreneur. You've done many um, startups in the past. You've mm -hmm. worked for a consulting firm mm -hmm. back then in, the, in your early years. Um, has that been in the consulting firm, has that be helped you a lot in, in, in this journey of, of starting companies? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's one of the things of how I kind of got into the whole sort of startup thing to begin with was yeah. I started my career at the end of the first dot-com boom. Yeah. Oh, so my God. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah, time to start. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so at that time, you know, um, in this consulting firm actually based here in Singapore, you know, I was doing a lot of like I was writing business plans for startups. I was doing like due diligence for like VCs. And mm. so that kind of really got me into, you know, that whole um, this whole space and really interested in you know, how the process worked and also trying to like do something a bit different. So Has there always been tech? Uh, yeah, it's always been in been tech for me, but I guess, you know, I've al always, I mean, through my career, I think, you know, subsequently worked in management consulting, mm -hmm. helping like, you know, pretty big companies. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I uh, spent actually uh, before founding Ambi, uh, you know, spent five years as a private uh, equity sort of guy in Hong Kong, yeah. uh, but investing throughout Asia. And so I guess the stuff that, you know, I've looked at has been tech, but also things like biotech, uh, materials like commodities. Um, you know, sort of restaurant businesses, like yeah. pretty much a pretty wide range of uh, experiences on that side. Actually, maybe you could give me a bit of insights about this because I'm I'm really interested in the fact that, I mean, from someone like you who has worked in consulting with large corporations, mm -hmm. and then you've also worked in the private equity firm, which is what we call wh what I consider um, more sort of later stage yeah. money, right? Definitely. Then you've got the other side of the equation, which has been glorified and been romanticized so much mm -hmm. um, with the huge exit of Facebook, and Amazon, and all those big, mm. you know, gigantic sort of um, IPOs. Um, they are actually what people tend to refer as the fairy dust, right? Because mm. it's still yet to be proven. You've got the AI, the blockchain, yeah. a lot of white papers and theories. 
what is your view on that? Because then you come from that sort of later stage world mm -hmm. and then you had to transition to convincing people to invest in something that is very much, much earlier. Right, yeah. I mean, I'd say that, you know, certainly, I, I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to do, you know, get involved and actually do a startup myself was, you know, I guess I spent most of my career kind of, you know, giving people advice, telling people yeah. what to do, and also, you know, trying to invest and make, uh, you know, judgment calls about, about companies. And I think that in the later stage companies, uh, perhaps it's a little bit more clear cut because you tend to have, you know, better, more uh, well-defined strategy. You tend mm. to have a lot more execution track record. And, you know, there's still a lot of, like, uh, variables to the equation, but I think it's, you know, relatively, it's a clearer picture. Yeah. Whereas, um, I guess, you know, in a in the startup side, I mean, that this is something that's been re a real eye-opener for me. I mean, I guess, you know, really learning about the whole, you know, the whole uh, uh, sort of iterative development. There are a lot of unknowns, I think, yeah. that... You know, that it's sort of like staring at the end of the tunnel and hoping that you see a flicker of lights. At, yeah, at I mean, end. I guess sometimes, and I, you know, the whole sort of uh, sort of uh, entrepreneur roller coaster. That's something yeah. you know you definitely feel a lot. The grind, yeah, yeah, the grind, and mm. yeah, I think it's it's definitely been. Uh, I think a lot of you know, I'd say that now compared to you know maybe in the past, you know, in when I was in the PE space, uh, you know, invest. If we spoke to sort of earlier stage companies at yeah. all. I was perhaps less understanding of you know their their journey. I didn't really understand you know how how hard it is as a you know a, it's sort of a younger company. But also, I think as a private, I, I've always been a, um, in the pr in the private bank side, mm -hmm. and b from the finance perspective, you are conditioned to look at certain numbers, at certain figures, and you want to find patterns where those things match. Yeah. Now, when you s cross over to the startup world, none of that actually matters because every financial projections or the valuation. I mean, not so much for Ambi Labs, mm -hmm. more for like very early stage mm -hmm. companies in your earlier years. A lot of that is just projections. It's as good as writing sci-fi. Yeah. And so you have to be able to convince the investor that this is what you're going to execute, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And especially with Ambi Labs per se, because that journey that you had to go through, um, did, you, did it take for you to re rethink the way that you used to do as a as a private equity um, and as well as a consultant for large corporations. Yeah, I mean, I think I definitely did. I guess you know, uh, certainly as I, you know, I used to work as a strategy consultant. So, mm. I mean, certainly, I think that some th some things I did you know benefit from and were very Absolutely. applicable to you know the startup space. So yeah. I think you know in terms of like really trying to understand the problem, really trying to you know. Uh, sort of uh, develop a strategy and a plan that really would, you know, had uh, long-term potential. I mean, these are definitely skills that were very useful. Yeah, absolutely. But I guess, you know, I think comparatively, you know, I think you do realize that in a startup, in a especially younger stage startup, I think, you know, execution really, you know, uh, really matters it's a lot. 99% perspiration, yeah. right? Yeah. Ideas definitely. achieved, there's yeah. a lot of ideas. Definitely. I think that even, you know, if you have like a really well put together strategy, I guess in, in a larger corporation or later stage company, you know, I think that you can sort of work to your plan a little bit better. Yeah. But I think in a very young startup, sometimes you have to be a lot more sort of tactical, a lot more. You just grab the opportunities that come by. Well, you have to have the hunger. Yeah. Yeah. But I think also it's like, you know, if you if you created the you know, perfect strategy, mm. but it's something that, you know, may make a lot of sense, but is uh, relatively hard to action because of maybe, uh, you know, certain opportunities or certain connections sometimes. Mm. For example, I mean, they've, you know, we've been talking to large corporates for, you know, a long time now. But I think that sometimes, you know, some of these large corporates, you know, they are certainly interested. You know, we get a lot of meetings with them, but it can be a very long process. And as a startup, you can't, you know, wait to execute your ideal no. strategy. You just have to grab what comes along as well. Because for every day you're waiting, I mean, they can afford to do all that DD. They yeah. can afford to, to really time is on their side. They've got money on their side. Um, for a startup, it's time is of the essence. Yeah. You yes. either run out of money or you run out of the time. Yeah. And I, like they say, right, a CEO and a, fo a founder should never stop raising. Mm -hmm. um, and raising is not just about money. It's also about, you know, raising interest, raising customers, yeah. raising capital. Um, and in your case, especially for coming into a space which is so tech, mm -hmm. um, not just on the software side, but it's a hardware and software sort of integration, right? Yeah. And then you have to convince people there's AI in it and mm -hmm. how does that work, right? Yeah. Which I'm, I'm super excited to jump into it. 
Um, AI is one of the spaces that I try to bring as much as possible to the show. Um, our audiences, we have a wide array of um, AI sort of um, topics that we, we want to put f f in front of them. Um, specifically this one, which has a hardware software integration. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about your, um, your products. How sure. does it work? Right. So maybe it's to step back a little bit. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, sure. talking, you know, I guess, well, firstly, overall, you know, our product is an AI powered accessory for air conditioners. Yeah. And we actually change the way people use their air conditioners. And one of the main benefits that we get is that our users find it's more, not just more comfortable, they yep. actually save energy as well. So is energy saving that is that is the primary? Well, at the moment, uh, because you know we need a better sort of because uh, our device is not wired into the air conditioner, we don't have as much energy energy data as we'd like. Okay. So that's something that we want to prove more definitively. But mm -hmm. our users have uh, given us feedback that you know they quite often they save in a sort of cooling environment. They save maybe about twenty percent of their a AC energy consumption, and in a heating environment, it's about ten percent or thereabouts. Okay. Cool. So, but how do we do all of this? Well, yeah. the, the main problem that we solve, uh, kind of on the next slide, yeah, um, sure. is that actually today when you control an air conditioner, you can only set a temperature. However, on the next slide as well, um, you actually, uh, you know, thermal comfort is a multi-factor sort of issue. Mm -hmm. It's not just temperature that's important. Mm -hmm. Quite often other factors like humidity or sunlight coming in the room, changing weather outside, all of these things change what feels hot or cold to you. So... Yeah. That's why you actually get a lot of problems with using the air conditioner. I think the most common complaint is actually waking up cold uh, in the morning. Oh yeah, I was just coughing the hot, like halfway through the night because yeah. it was so dry. Yeah, so that's certainly uh, the uh, air sort of being dry and also being too cold. Part of it is like really also understanding the way the air conditioners work. But mm -hmm. you know, certainly from the you know the, just the purely the temperature perspective because your metabolism slows down overnight, okay. and also because the air temperature outdoors gets cooler, yeah, and yeah. which means that your air conditioner gets more efficient and actually cools harder, it's kind of a double whammy. So yeah. you need it to be less cold, but actually it gets more cold, mm -hmm. and that's why everyone wakes up too cold in the morning. Yeah. So that's one of those things where, you know, uh, that's, you know, one issue. Another common issue is, you know, like, let's say changing weather, if there's a seasonality aspect or if there's a thunderstorm coming outside, that mm. actually means that, you know, suddenly you're comfortable one minute and next minute you're like kind of too cold in your room. Well, in, in Singapore, I think that the temperature does vary day and mm. night, but yeah. night a, as a whole is sort of like still OK. Right? Right, right. But if you go to countries where they have four seasons mm -hmm. and sometimes like temperature would drop overnight um just two or three degrees yeah especially like um, places like hong kong mm -hmm. um, taiwan and china mm -hmm. where you have that sudden change they're just very irregular yeah yeah so that's why it's like a lot of people do kind of struggle a little bit with controlling their air conditioners mm -hmm. and it's not just about comfort you know yeah. if you have the air conditioner on and you're feeling cold then you're just wasting energy oh absolutely yeah so the way that our system works is that you know we kind of combine the sensor data from our device, and we also pull in. Uh, so just back to the previous slide a second. Yeah. yeah. So, so we also pull in uh, like sort of weather data from the internet, and we combine that with a comfort scale on our app. So through the app or through like a voice assistant, like Google, uh, you know, Google Assistant or Amazon Alexa, yeah. you can just tell us if you feel you know hot, cold, or comfortable. Yeah. And as you give us that feedback, we use machine learning to kind of understand how these different factors affect your comfort. So over time, the machine actually learns that what 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 would be the best sort of um, yeah. temperature for you as a as a person. Yes. Yes. Okay. So and then um, on the next slide. So we actually our model kind of consider there's two parts. So this first part, which I just kind of mentioned, is yeah. learning about what is comfortable to you. Yeah. It's a very personalized experience, of and course. also it's not static. You know, over time it will evolve as the seasons change, as you mentioned just now. The second model we have actually learns about how your air conditioner works because okay. the same model air conditioner in a big room or small room or different layouts, actually the performance can be very different. Yeah. So by putting these two together, we're actually able to automatically adjust the air conditioner and uh, for this uh, optimal comfort and also minimize overcooling, overheating situations to save energy. So it's actually connected to the uh, to the uh, it's collecting data from the air conditioner, the air conditioner itself, and it's collecting data from from me as the, as the user. So uh, we collect, uh, so, you know, through the device, you know, we collect like there's a temperature, humidity, and a sort yeah. of a, like a, a two-channel light sensor for visible and infrared light. We pull in the weather uh, data from the internet. And then uh, through these, we kind of combine, you know, to actually understand about you. 
yeah. then actually the uh, air conditioner itself, we're not wired in, so we can't actually directly connect collect data from the air conditioner. Yeah. But we know sort of what settings the air conditioner is on. Okay. So that means that as we, you know, let's say when you set it to a particular setting, we can learn what happens in the room, yep. you know, how quickly it cools down, what is the final sort of temperature, because it can vary quite a lot. You yep. get some air conditioners like with very good control systems mm -hmm. that are almost spot on accurate. Yep. And you get some other ones perhaps. Which is the range. Yeah, well, there can be quite a big range. It can be like, you know, mm -hmm. plus or minus two degrees, which is a, a massive difference. So uh, can we just show the, sure. the it's very cute. <laughs> Where would it sit in the house? So this, uh, because there's sensors in here, we do recommend that the users put it kind of close to where they in the, uh, are in the room. So you do need one for each room. Mm -hmm. So let's say in the bedroom, we'd suggest you put it on your bedside table. Uh, so it's kind of collecting the temperature close to you because yep. actually in a room is not consistent temperatures throughout the room, right? Mm -hmm. There are pockets of warm and cold. Yep. Um, or yeah, so in the living room, it'd probably be close to kind of the sofa or something like that. And then you mentioned that this all of, all of the information that is collected across all of the different devices, and um, you as a as as the user, mm -hmm. is that something that I can track it on the on the phone, or would there be any sort of display that would show me um, some some stats that yeah. will help me make better? decisions yeah so actually so I mean firstly you know uh, the, we try to abstract all of that away so the user just has to tell us if they feel hot or cold okay and then the AI will kind of take over and sort of automatically adjust give you the perfect settings yeah. but of course you know nowadays I think you know a lot of times especially since everything says that it has AI so you know yeah. I think a lot of users do want to like uh, understand what's going on yeah they're not happy with just this black box and AI is sort of really being uh, generalized yeah. to everything I mean everything that and I, I was reading a report as well the uh, a couple of months ago on like how many like what the difference between machine learning ai and smart matching algorithm and all of mm -hmm. that and i think as a whole people tend to like categorize them all together into one lump yeah yeah that's that definitely is the case so uh, actually, you know, so for us, we found a lot of times our users, you know, really want to understand what's going on in the AI. So, of course, we do provide like data sort of insights and visualization in the app yep. to help people try to get a picture of what's going on. Yeah. Um, because, of course, you know, that for them to trust the AI and, you know, is something that they, they need to understand. Well, and people want to know how, you know, and, and uh, what are we doing as human beings? We are all kind of pattern matching. Yeah. And so if we see something that is completely has no explanation. Yeah. It's sort of like, you know, going to Narnia land, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to buy something in that kind of space, but you want to buy something that you are able to make sense of it. Yeah. Um, and th th when you are working on the AI aspects, how hard was it to build the AI technology? Because, uh, I mean, there's so much data, and then there's a the cleaning of the data, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of noise, right, yeah. that is capturing. Yeah. How, do you, how difficult it is to, to clean the data? So, I mean, I guess there is something that, you know, for us, we have it because we are operating a real-time system, yep. which is kind of different. Um, uh, you know, it means that, you know, uh, we're always collecting new data. We're always yep. retraining the models. Yep. And that actually means there's a lot of maintenance and overhead involved. First, oh, as yeah. you mentioned, sort of cleaning the data, but also we need to track and make sure that new data being introduced doesn't, you know, kind of yeah. make the performance worse. It wouldn't throw it out because it's garbage in, garbage out, right? Yeah, yeah. It's essentially you don't want like um, the information that wasn't meant to be there and sort yeah. of throws everything out. Yeah, I mean, learning. or certainly, you know, let's say as, as you're saying, because, you know, machine learning is all like kind of pattern matching. So, yeah. you know, let's say if we start off with, if we suddenly have a big growth of like heating users, yeah. we got to make sure that that doesn't negatively affect the cooling users, for example. Or if you had a guest that yeah. suddenly likes 28 degrees, yeah. you know, a night, and then you're used to it. And when you move back in, especially in situations where you rent it out for Airbnb, mm. um, that could be a bit tricky, right? Yeah, well, uh, for that case, you know, we do create individual profiles. So in, if that was the case and, the, you know, if the user wanted to, you know, grant access to, uh, you know, a, a guest user, that certainly ca can be done and will be a separated profile. Oh, it's sort of like um, how Netflix is doing, like you can separately create a, a profile yeah. and just like that user. So in the future, every guest that comes in, you could completely sort of uh, customize it. For yeah. Each yeah. One. Fantastic. Um, so right now, the the product has been used by widely across different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Where I where is it mainly like the more popular regions? So I think overall, because because we ran a couple of Kickstarter campaigns that you know, and with the sort of global reach of Kickstarter, it means we do have users in quite a few countries, about seventy countries right now. I'd oh say. wow. 
Um, our key, but we do have key pockets, and you know, certainly yeah. Hong Kong being kind of our home market, and having you know, kind of wider awareness. Uh, that's you know, th- uh, definitely concentration there. Uh, and then other markets with uh, a concentration would be sort of Singapore, Thailand, yeah. US, and Japan. C- when did you go? Ch- when did you do uh, the crowdfunding? We actually did two Kickstarter. So this is actually our second generation device. The okay. first one we did in 2014, yeah. um, and then the second one we did last year. What was the difference between the first generation and the second generation? So it was mainly to do with kind of like um, some of the industrial design, mm-hmm. the aesthetic appeal. I mean, the mm-hmm. sort of functionality because, you know, the hardware is, um, you know, it's, you know, certainly there's the sensors and there's, you know, the Wi-Fi and all of those sort of things. But, but the aesthetics is just, just as important. Yes. So certainly, and that's one of the, uh, been a very big difference, I'd say, in terms of our sort of uptake for the second generation has been this revi- uh, refined sort of industrial design, yeah. especially because for our product, you know, we're not like the typical sort of more techie smart home product. Okay. So actually, we've been quite fortunate that because of our sort of AI model and it's, uh, you know, the, the simplicity of yeah. how it works has been attractive, not just to your typical sort of uh, sort of male uh, sort of smart home enthusiasts, yep. but we've also had quite a lot of, uh, you know, female users as well. Oh, I can say, and I can totally see, I mean, not just female, but like more sort of the younger generation mm-hmm. where it's, it's very slick, mm-hmm. right? And we are in a period not entirely new, but it's been a movement of this entire minimalism mm-hmm. um, type of um, lifestyle. And yeah. I certainly subscribe a lot to that. My house is absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. And it have, if I'm going to put anything in it, it will have to be something that that carries that sort of minimalism, slickness, mm-hmm. um, that, that kind of feel, right? Was mm-hmm. that something that design that went through your mind when you guys were designing it? Yeah, definitely. Because I think partly it's also because of the way the device works. You need to have the sensors exposed. You know, you can't hide this device yeah. away. Otherwise, we're not collecting good well, data. Well, in the case of a lot of IOTs, it's the same. You have to have it in a very public eye yeah. sort of situation. So that's where we wanted a device where, you know, it's not something that's going to be an eyesore. It's not going to be something every day you look at it and you're like, okay, it works great, but I just wish it didn't I'm going to shove way. it in the storeroom. <laughs> yeah, room, yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah. So I think that's where, you know, we've, uh, that's also really helped us sort of appeal to like a wider audience rather yeah. than just the traditional sort of uh, early adopter community. Yeah. And the, and the younger sort of the crowd, obviously, those are the ones that, that tend to care a lot about health. Mm-hmm. and sort of the, 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 their living standards as compared to like I think the older generation where yeah it, it's great you know the health thing but it's all about what is um, the less about they don't understand the AI so mm-hmm. it takes a lot more time mm-hmm. I think the, the sort of the working um, adult mm-hmm. um, workforce the younger generation they tend to see this as uh, something just you can put it in your living room and it looks nice, but it also has a practical side mm. to it. Yeah, I mean, I think so. But also, we do see it's like actually mm. we have a, a you know a niche uh, in our market where yeah. in a lot of uh, sort of parents of young children buy our device as oh, well. Oh yeah, because mm. you know certainly like you know I think uh, the if, children and yeah, all the, the children yeah. the sort of comfort, but also you know when the child is asleep, you know a lot of parents don't really want to go into the room. They don't want to wake the baby. So mm. you know having a device that can sort of automatically fine tune and take care of the environment. And also, you know, remotely control as well, uh, so they can monitor it from, you know, the outside in the living room. These are all things that are attractive to that segment of users. I actually want to pick your brain a little bit on your experience of um, doing a Kickstarter, Mm -hmm. um, especially your early, because they say that, you know, it's literally a movement. You Mm -hmm. have to create that excitement and all that sort of hype and then when you launch it like you want to make sure that all of those people that you've been working on it rushes in and, yep. and place the first order was yeah. that the same experience for you yeah i mean i definitely think so i mean i think you know for us we were kind of uh, also fortunate i guess you know before we uh you know created our first kickstarter campaign we were uh, i guess active on the sort of pitch circuit in asia oh, so yeah. we actually meant that the li- li- people were starting to become aware of us and yeah. we also created like a mailing list so that you know, p- you know kind of keeping in touch so it actually meant that you know when we launched the first kickstarter we already had a pool of people uh, yeah. you know who uh, to actually like kind of drive the initial momentum mm-hmm. and then i think from there you know things just uh, you know they do grow on the platform how so was the experience like 
It was for you as a co-founder. Yeah. <laughs> it was definitely interesting, uh, very hectic. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a lot going on and always trying to kind of uh, iterate and tweak, you know, on the fly. You have that sort of, you know, sort of 40 day period where you're yeah. trying to like push, push, push every day and every day come up with new ideas of how we can, you know, get the word out further. And make videos and, yeah. and, and dra raise concerns. Mm -hmm. How much of that? Because obviously I know that Ambi, um, you mentioned before, there's some eco um, space on it. It's the whole purpose isn't just about um, you know controlling the air temperature, but it, but it also saves energy. Mm -hmm. And so that in when you're in that space, I think is where you pass beyond sort of um, the the focus on just purely making money, but also about that social entrepreneurship and how you can be a more efficient in terms of cost as well as uh, friendly to the environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that, you know, we do uh, definitely, you know, look at quite seriously. Yeah. And I think that that's something, that, you know, since then, uh, you know, we are actually right now in discussions with some utilities around the world yeah. to actually, uh, you know, I guess that, you know, with the utilities, they are looking at ways to, of course, you know, they want to, you know, sell more energy, but they also want They, I think they're very sensitive to the concerns of the consumer yeah. about, uh, you know, being more uh, energy efficient nowadays. I think these eco concerns about kind of global warming and you know, sort oh of pollution yeah. and that sort of thing has meant that we have a much more sort of eco responsible consumer today. Um, and you wanna have that as a brand and your, your box is green, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, you want to show that it, it is down to the core of the vision of the organization mm -hmm. to, to not just about profitability, but it's about how are you better off um, you know, to your consumers and how you're helping your consumers to to have a more sort of um, uh, along in the same vision. Because your first customers, they always say, are your visionaries, mm -hmm. and so are your investors. So, to be able to translate all of that in your in the packaging, it's something that um, I guess the digital world find it a a, lo a little bit harder mm -hmm. as compared to something that you can touch and feel. Yeah, I mean that's some certainly you know aspects you know of our packaging. I mean, I think even you know. Of course, there's the eco element, there's the branding side as well. But mm -hmm. I think you know, definitely in the, at a core value level, you know, we uh, that's what we want to do as well. So there's certainly you know we use sort of eco-friendly packaging materials. Like this is all like on the packaging, it's a kind of bamboo paper and that's sort of oh, thing. it so is. Yeah, so okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, so how 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 did that how did that come about? Well, I mean, it was just, I think, as we were sort of looking at the packaging and looking mm. at the sourcing, I mean, it was one of those things where we realized that we could, you know, do it, you know, it, w it wouldn't add too much cost to actually do it in that way. Yep. And it was something that, you know, we wanted to do, you know, just as a, our own company value. So that's certainly, a, you know, a key part of what we're doing. As well. And bamboo grows very fast, mm -hmm. right? And that is one of the reasons why a lot of sort of paper manufacturers are looking at this space of how do you make bamboo, which is something really tough to transform into paper mm -hmm. but i've seen um especially out of china a lot of tissue paper mm. that is made out of bamboo because of that sort of ambience um concern on on bleaching and, mm. and using white um traditional forms of um, tissue paper yeah yeah i think i think these are all very you know important things i think you know yeah. for the consumer overall and i guess that's one of those things i guess as a core concept you know this the ai and reducing overcooling I mean, I, th I don't know how, how bad it gets here in Singapore, but mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, I mean, you know, quite often you hear about people who, you know, when they're uh, sort of like lying in there on their sofa watching TV, a lot of people have a blanket nearby. So in the uh, summer, you yeah, know, when yeah. the air con is too strong, they put on a blanket. But yeah. if, you, if you think about it, that's very silly. Why? Because, yeah, you're just <laughs> wasting energy. Or Singapore too. Like you uh -huh. go to restaurants and it's like they will give you uh, a shawl uh -huh. or yeah. something um, to cover yourself up because yeah. the air con being blasted so strong. Yeah, and I think that, in fact, in Hong Kong, it even goes to some extremes. I think that, you know, in some uh, office buildings, uh, you know, I know of uh, some, you know, like in, in my previous jobs, I know of some female colleagues who had a fan heater under their desk. Uh -huh. <laughs> because it gets too cold in the summer. And yeah. if you think about it, that's just, you know, just a very, uh, you know, un, not, not, you know, uneco-friendly. It's just, uh, it doesn't Absolutely. make sense. Yeah. Actually, that brings me to, uh, to another point, which is, um, does it, besides controlling sort of air con, because mm -hmm. in a lot of countries, I'm sure your customers, especially if you go through Kickstarters, they don't just come from um, temperatures where you only use air con, you use mm -hmm. heater as well. Mm -hmm. Does it, at this moment, does it integrate with heater? So we actually work with, so we work with those air conditioning units, sort of split systems, but a lot okay. of them nowadays are reverse cycle, they heat as well. Yeah. So that's certainly where we have customers now, you know, in sort of uh, Japan, in New Zealand, and in Scandinavia, where they primarily use it for, you know, or they use air heating quite extensively yeah and and it's it's heating in a way sort of consume just as much electricity if no more um in countries where um a lot of snow 
mm-hmm. um, places like Russia, for example, right. Scandinavia. It's one of those things. I was in Scandinavia last um, two years ago, mm-hmm. and um, the heating system there. If you if you are in a pe- in a period of time where it's no, you don't regulate it right. Mm-hmm. It could get very, very hot. Yeah. Just the moment you start, it's like walking into a oven. Yes, yeah, yeah. I definitely, definitely know what you mean there. But actually, you know, overall, there's been a drive towards these sort of uh, they call them heat pumps in there. Mm-hmm. You know, air conditioning with heating systems. Yep. Um, and actually, they found that heat pumps are actually more efficient than a lot of traditional heating. Oh yeah. Because you know, like let's say if you use uh, electrical heating, you're actually you create heat from electricity. Yeah. But the way heat pump works is that it moves heat in from you know out outside to in and it can be very efficient in that way so there's an overall i think a drive in this market to w- in that direction right um so it's there uh, i've also seen that you've you've um won a couple of awards mm-hmm. in the in 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 hong kong right. was it, it, it just mainly in hong kong was it around asia region? actually hong kong asia i mean i guess you know for us um if you uh yeah so we w- uh, some things I guess are not on our slide. Actually, back in uh, 2014, you know, we were here in uh, Echelon, and we actually won ah, the yeah. You know, People's Choice Award there. Awesome. And then we did, you know, we had some. You should put that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But then yeah. you've got IoT Asia Singapore, so that is pretty big as well. Yeah, I guess I mean it's because you know 2014 it means that you know the older things kind of drop off at the end. We can't you know really talk about them too much anymore. But yeah, so and then we also have I think recently you know we're not moving away from more startup awards to more yeah. design awards. So like kind of uh, like last year you know at Computex in Taiwan we won a DNI award uh, mm-hmm. for design. Um, and you know, this year there's the German Design Award and the Industrial uh, Designer Society of America. So I think you know why we are looking at awards. I think part of it is that you know the consumer sort of confidence because I think yeah. you know, with this new category of products like AI incorporated products, you know, I think consumers do uh, you know it helps them kind of uh, those get you know get rid of those hygiene factors where you know they're not sure how good your product is. Does it really work? So well, I would say. It doesn't matter how good your technology, you could have the most amazing technology, but if when you deploy into the market and it gets rejected, right? Mm. Ultimately, the people that are judging you th- are the, at those panels and are deciding whether they want to award you. They are consumers. They are seeing whether they want to use your product and whether it's something that is worthwhile pushing forward to the community. Mm-hmm. And with that in mind, what do you think um, s- m- different sort of separated you from competition, right. especially not just from the award um, sure. aspect, but from yeah. from other type of um, aircon mm. um, controlling energy efficiency type of um, devices. Right. So I'd say the main thing is our sort of uh, very sort of uh, the comfort centric focus so yeah. and the AI component. So mm. every other device out there today, whether it's an air conditioner, a Wi-Fi based air conditioner, or even like other sort of smart air conditioner controllers, everything is purely temperature focused. Yeah. So we're the only ones who right now who are considering this multi-factor approach yep. and then using AI to kind of solve that. And yeah. that's something I guess that resonates with a lot of people. I think it's something that people may not realize, you know, straight off the bat. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm comfortable at 25 degrees. But then if they think about it, they do realize, oh, there are times when it's hot, sometimes times when it's cold. And then I think that, you know, uh, there's th- so there's a lot of consumer education we need to do yeah. to uh, explain to them kind of the root cause of their comfort problems and how we can help them solve it. But I, l- uh, I think, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So a yeah. lot of our users, you know, they start off with one device. They try really it out. Like it, and then yeah. buy a second and a third. And obviously your best customers are the ones that come back and they refer you. Those are the most powerful. They're more sticky yeah. as well. Yeah, so certainly, yeah. certainly. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go in the education front where mm-hmm. you mentioned a Bit rogue, <laughs> which you mentioned. I mean, I was in the lab for cybersecurity uh-huh. um, for one of the universities yesterday night, right. and um, they were talking about like how IoT devices are becoming more of a concern because sure. of the sort of disclosure mm-hmm. that of privacy yeah. for especially from from the media that's publicized so much when s- a particular celebrity has been had the cameras on or had mm-hmm. um, their their um, sort of a smartwatch on. Yeah. Has there been any concern in this space when if I was going to have a device like this in my hu- in my bedroom, for example, where I walk around naked, nobody heard that. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and um, was there going to be any information that's going to be carried or is, is, is less of a concern be- because of the type of data that it's collecting? I think we are very s- concerned on our side. So mm-hmm. we're very security conscious. Like, you know, we do, 
you know, I, you know, certainly not, I think no one in their right mind would, you know, claim that something is, you know, a hundred percent secure, but, mm -hmm. you know, we do the best that we can. So, yeah. you know, our device, you know, we use like, certainly we use uh, encryption back all the way, you know, back to our server. Everything is end to end encrypted. Yeah. Um, and we also do, you know, try to uh, make sure that, you know, things like, you know, all of our back end is designed in a security friendly way. Yeah. And even like on the app, you know, so certainly we don't track. Uh, you know, so, for example, we do have a common feature, which is geofencing. So, okay. you know, you can yeah. turn on your aircon automatically as you go home. Yeah. But we, the, we, the, your GPS location never leaves your phone. We don't want to know. <laughs> we don't want to collect that data. Okay. We only know if you have arrived, you know, in this home vicinity or not. But just because you don't collect it doesn't mean that I can't. If I was a hacker with malicious intent, I could actually, could I get in there? Or is that completely sort of um, protected in, from, from people trying to get access to the device? So, yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, it's not, uh, it, so in terms of your GPS location data, it that's something, yeah, it, 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 it's, not, it's not something that our app, you know, ever, you know, uh, you know, focus basically collects that data of your of your location. Yeah, yeah, uh, that is r uh, that is really important. Um, and and I think as consumers get more and more educated on this space, especially on the IoT space, as as attractive as it is in terms of gathering data, putting it on the cloud, and be able to aggregate that to make um, more sort of um, better informed decisions for for the machine, so that it would make it more convenient for the consumer. Um, that awareness of of of, of privacy mm. is still something i think i think for the type of data as well um that you guys are collecting is is less of a uh, um what i would say because there's no cameras on it mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. if there was cameras and if it's capturing actually voice um that you know certain conversations could be like public i think with ambi climate because of the inherently it was designed to capture more data for for control of temperature mm -hmm. energy it would be less of a co uh, less much less of a concern in this case. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's where you know, so there have been people who have asked us to include you know some other things uh, inside. For yeah. example, that people have asked us to include you know thermal cameras and yeah. you know things like that. And I think that we've always uh, trying to balance. You know, certainly yeah. there's some data that would help us and be a very interesting from a machine learning perspective. But yeah. we also don't want to be too intrusive. Because, you know, as we said, this device is something that, you know, sits in your home and it's always, you know, kind of monitoring your environment. And so we don't want to, you know, I, I think every piece of data we collect is something we always ask ourselves, you know, how how important is this and how much value Do we, we really adding? need it. Yes. I, that's so smart. Um, we've seen people where and also it helps you in the cleaning of the data. So mm -hmm. isn't it? it's yeah. less work. Um, we've seen other um, companies where they want to collect everything and anything. Yeah. And just like really, like how much of an impact will will collecting that data? And then it goes to like where are you storing this data, and uh, how are you uh, how are you clean how are you processing it? Yeah. So this space is is very very interesting. And I, I I think did we see a little bit of um I, did we get a little bit of insights of what is next for Ambi? Well, I think next for Ambi right now we're we're definitely very focused on pushing out into the market. So you know uh, today you know. Uh, we on the B two C side, you know, we are currently in retail in uh, about a dozen countries, and towards the end of this year, we should be getting close to about twenty countries. Yeah. And at the same time, we are also working a lot with B two B partners. Yeah. For example, we have a property development in Hong Kong that we're partnering with, and should be. Oh, that uh, would be huge. Yeah. Because so then they would just once they build a something, yeah. that every every room will have it, right? Yeah. yeah, that's what we're doing. So it's about a thousand apartments there, and you know, we that uh, of course property projects take a bit longer, so that will be shipping in about twenty twenty, mm -hmm. and we are also uh, working with sort of utilities uh, kind of as we mentioned earlier to kind of help them you know, you know uh, kind of um, introduce more smart technology into their consumers homes so I guess that's you know on, on these uh, a lot of our sort of the main work that we're doing is to do with these integrations and these new uh, sort, sort of, of expansion and, yep. and, and uh, collaboration what about on the um, R&D side yeah. were you looking at creating uh, extension of Ambi? Well, I mean, on, uh, certainly, you know, we do have, you know, product plans. A lot of them are actually software based and more sort of um, enhancements to the current product. Okay. Of course, you know, being, you know, the longer sort of uh, development cycles for hardware does mean that, you know, we are starting to sort of plan for our next uh, generation product as well. I can't wait to see your next generation Thank project. Um, well, I have one more question. Sure. Uh, it's been fantastic. I could actually talk about this the whole day and talk about the environment, talk mm -hmm. about AI. Um, but we have, um, how would our listeners um, able to reach you? And, and also on that point, 
you are also looking to hire. You, are, you guys are yes. hired. So for all of you that are looking to work for a hardware software integrated company, um, could you talk about, uh, about your, your hiring and how they, ca they are able to reach you? Sure. So, I mean, I think, you know, you can, uh, everyone's always free to sort of drop me an email. It's just julian at ambiclimate.com. Um, in on the recruitment side, you know, we are, uh, of course, you know, I think that there's a, always a fight for talent, you know, in the startup space, always. you know, everywhere around the world. Yeah. So we're definitely always on the lookout for good talent to join our team. I mean, you know, and because I guess, you know, I think the complexities of uh, IoT or AI and IoT mm. sort of startup does mean that we have quite a wide range of positions we're looking for from, you know, product to, you know, developers to sort of uh, like business operations. Engineers. And and engineers, and, uh, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of a lot that we need. Then sales. Um, yes, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> you need people to be traveling around, especially if you're dealing with 70 countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at the, where would they, uh, any particular region or are you looking at, at a global, global um, positions? I mean, at the moment, I think we're still mainly focused on sort of uh, building up a lot of our core sort of teams in Hong Kong. Okay. But, you know, over time, we will certainly start to expand into look at, you know, regional offices and the like as well. Fantastic. Well, it's been a total pleasure having you on the show, Julian. Yeah, for me too. Thank you. And I, I look forward to your next trip to Singapore. Please let us know and we'll see if we can uh, come on the show and see how the, your progress go towards. Definitely. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening this week. Um, we are really delighted to have Julian on the show from Ambi Labs. This is the Extra Tech Podcast, Pitch Tech Asia. I'm your host, Gustavo Liu. Thank you for listening. <laughs>